Known for its incredible level of difficulty, the Dark Souls series became notorious for its punishing gameplay and unforgiving boss fights. With multiple paths to progress your character and a vast selection of equipment, the game offers players many options to try and master its challenges. Completing any of the games has become an accomplishment in and of itself, but for some players, beating it wasn't enough. They needed to show that not only could they beat the game, but that they could do it faster than anyone else. This is the history of Dark Souls 3 All Bosses. Released on March 28, 2017, The Ringed City would be the final DLC for Dark Souls 3, and it wouldn't take a single day for the first run to come in, with Aang's Master posting the first time just a few hours after release. The first big decision players make is in the character creation screen, where they make two selections, the Assassin class and Black Firebomb item. Assassin gives them access to the Spook spell, which we'll cover shortly and the Black Firebomb is a ranged weapon used in the first boss fight just over a minute into the run, Ayudix Gunder. Gunder has two phases players need to get through. In the first, they make quick attacks with L1 while circling him. After enough damage, he transforms into his second phase, where they make use of the Firebomb, tossing three of them to end the encounter. From here, they start making their way through the high wall of Lothric, picking up an essential item, the Gold Pine Resin and showing why the Spook spell is so important. Spook has two effects. It silences your movements, and more importantly, it reduces fall damage, allowing players to bypass sections of the game with calculated jumps off the walls. While clearing out more of the early game bosses, he picks up the bread and butter weapon for the run, the Sellsword Twin Blades. These are dual-wielded one-handed weapons with two special properties, upgrades and infusions. There is an area in the game called the Firelink Shrine that serves as a hub world. Players can buy items, level up, and upgrade their weapons here. Since the Twin Blades are a cornerstone of the run, it's important to understand how they contribute going forward. Throughout the last few splits, Aang's picked up Titanite so that he could use it to upgrade the Twin Blades. Each level gives him more base physical damage, and on the first visit, they're upgraded to plus 4, but they also get infused. Infusions are special weapon upgrades that require certain rare gems to add powerful bonuses to your weapon. If you kill the Crystal Lizard, he drops the Sharp Gem, which adds a dexterity scaling bonus to weapons when infused. And since he's increasing dexterity by 30 points this visit, it's put to use right away. After leaving Firelink, he has a few fights before arriving at Irithyll of the Boreal Valley where he kills Sullivan's beast before making his way to the stairs to set up the Irithyll Skip. Irithyll Skip allows players to cut a large portion of the Irithyll Valley by jumping out of bounds over the stair railing. He uses a save and quit to drop all aggro and reset enemy spawn positions. Incredibly useful, and you'll see a lot of these throughout the run. After the Irithyll Skip, runners pick up a few Titanite shards before arriving at the next boss, Yorm the Giant. Yorm is quite intimidating, and there aren't any glitches or skips runners use to make the fight any easier. Instead, they make use of Storm Ruler, a weapon sitting in the boss room that has a charge attack used to deal devastating damage to Yorm. With Storm Ruler equipped, the fight is essentially a slot machine, as there are limited actions Yorm will take. 
The best is a slam attack, where he pushes his sword down into the ground, giving the player an opportunity to attack without much risk. The worst attack is the stomp, where he lunges forward and shoots out a ring of flames, which knocks you down and breaks your charge on Storm Ruler. Ensk had two stomps out of the gate on Yorm, with better RNG in the latter half of the fight, allowing him to get the charge shots he needed without much issue. He uses a homeward bone to teleport to Firelink and puts down some more upgrades, increasing the twin blades to plus 6, his vitality to 13, and his dexterity to 40. With the twin blade upgrade, he's well equipped to slay bosses in the mid game, and he does just that. We'll get to all of them in time, but for now, let's look at a few important points. He dies three times on the Demon Prince fight before he manages to get the kill, only to crash after the victory. The game ends up giving him credit for the fight, and it's worth mentioning that Dark Souls is timed only while the player is playing. Load screens aren't factored in, so while a crash can lose you some time, it's not a fatal run killer as time stops from the time it crashes until you get back into the game. Next we arrive at Dark Eater Midir, one of the hardest bosses in the run due to the various patterns and attacks he uses throughout the fight. There's a pre-fight encounter with Midir on a bridge, but once that's completed, you can make your way down to the real battle. You have two phases to get through. In phase one, he has a few different attacks he can do, with short range slashes, a YOLO charge, two variants of his fire breath, and a flying fire breath attack. The goal here is to damage his head, and you can see that the fire breath attacks make it very difficult to do this. Aang's dies three times on this fight before he even gets to phase two, but on the fourth attempt, he gets into the second phase, taking huge damage on the AoE attack as it starts. In this phase, Medir gets even more aggressive, with charging flame breath attacks and faster combos, putting the margin of error very low for players looking to get a quick kill. He gets damaged again and is forced to use his remaining Estus Flask, then takes another shot, putting him to 2 HP as Medir charges away with more flame breath. If he takes any damage here, the fight is over, but with some nerves of steel, he gets through it and finishes Midir with a ripost. He dies six times on the next two bosses. To say that they're hard is an understatement, but we'll get to Gale and half Light a bit later. For now, let's look at the final two, Gravetender and Cinder. Gravetender is deep in the painted world of Ariandel, the first DLC, and luckily, there's a skip to get to him faster aptly named Gravetender Skip. The skip utilizes the second ability the Spook spell grants, reduced fall damage, and it combines it with a quit out to allow the player to jump off a cliff and land on an invisible platform after loading back in. Once on the platform below, they walk up and fight the Gravetender, cutting out about 35 seconds of walking. Gravetender himself is a two-phased fight, one against him with four wolves, and a final phase where the Great Wolf joins him. GT is tricky since he can shield from your attacks and counter, and the second phase starts when he hits a certain HP level, meaning if you're not quick, you could be fighting two bosses at once. Angs thinks he kills GT in his first fight, but he survived his attack with one HP, and to his surprise, the Arisen Grave Tender hit him for a lethal attack after he went to focus on the Great Wolf. On his way back, he failed the Grave Tender skip by not jumping and walking off the cliff instead, but he clutches the kill on his rematch and heads for the final boss, Cinder. To unlock Cinder, you need to offer up the souls of four fallen lords, previous bosses you've killed during the run. Each offered soul has a small animation, but you can cancel two of them by positioning yourself to fall as the animation starts, saving a couple of seconds. From here, there's a two-phase fight between you and the end of the run, with Cinder's first phase consisting mostly of long, slow, swinging attacks that only combo for one or two hits. Phase two is much harder, where he gains speed and comes out swinging like Barry Bonds, longer combos, and quicker attacks. He has no trouble with this fight though, and completes the first speedrun of all bosses with both DLCs, clocking in at 2.15.02 on March 28, 2017. Aang's Master's run was good for a day one record, but a day is all it would stand for, with Darave getting on a run the next day that improved on the record. 
His early game starts off good, but he forgets to grab the sharp gem from the crystal lizard and has to double back to pick it up, costing him a chunk of time. After correcting his mistake, he sets up for two big glitches the run depends on. The first being Farron Keep Skip. Farron Keep Skip, or FKS, is a glitch that involves triggering the death cam without dying. By positioning your camera at a certain angle and then jumping down into the ravine, you can jump out of the deadly fall just after the death cam triggers, keeping it active while you're still alive. While in this state, the game will stop loading enemies and objects further into the area, including a door required for progression, which saves about 2 minutes over having to open it the intended way. You only have a few hostiles to dodge before things start getting broken, with objects and enemies failing to load as you run through the area unhindered, with the death cam watching you from below. After the FKS, players have to fight the Abyss Watchers, but with another glitch called the Watchers glitch, players enter the fight without the boss loading its AI. By performing some specific movements, you can skip a trigger on the fog gate leading into the boss room. Once inside, the boss will stand in place, allowing you to attack until he's dead. It's worth mentioning that as he's heading to one of the first fights in the early game, he gets invaded by another player. Not wanting to face someone during a world record pace run, he switches his game to offline during a load in the Yorm split to avoid any potential confrontation. The Yorm fight itself went fine, but it was plagued with problems on the run to the boss, with some of the enemies giving him trouble, particularly Sullivan's Beast. After the skip, he makes for Pontiff Sullivan, and it starts off badly. Partway into the split, he gets mauled by dogs and dies. After the respawn, he arrives at the boss and prepares to start the fight. He applies gold pine resin to the twin blades and equips a shield in his offhand. The other great thing about the twin blades is that they allow you to equip a shield in your left hand, which lets you perform parries. The Sullivan fight is very straightforward. Parry his opening attack, repost, parry his second attack, repost, then perform a combo for the kill. If done correctly, it's finished in the blink of an eye, and at a very low risk to the player. He clears out three more bosses before arriving at the Ancient Wyvern, a giant boss in the Arch Dragon Peak. You'd think an HP bar that takes up most of the screen would be a long fight, which would be the case if not for the Chain Snake Skip. The CSS is an instant kill glitch that allows you to kill the wyvern without jumping from a great height as intended. The setup isn't the greatest, and you can see him try a few different methods, with the first being the fastest off the small altar, and the second, which is the backup strat, being a bit slower. It saves about 50 seconds over running to the top of the mountain and triggering the kill the intended way, and while he did take 6 attempts to hit the skip, he's ahead of the record at this point. After the fight, he has a few items to pick up in Arch Dragon Peak, with the final one being the Dragon Chaser's Ashes, which allow you to unlock Titanite chunks in the Firelink Shop for the final Twinblade upgrade. As he grabs the Ashes, Disaster strikes. Multiple enemies attack as he tries to use the Homeward Bone, and he ends up getting pushed off the cliff. Darave changes the order of bosses he does in the late game from Aang's Master and takes fewer deaths than Aang's did on the difficult fights, beating Nameless King without quitting out and not taking a single death on Half-Light or Gale. He's about 14 minutes ahead of the record going into the final boss, Cinder. And as he lights the last soul... <laughs> Please, Simodius, this record's not gonna last for long. Cinder goes well, and he locks in the record. He was right, though. His record wouldn't last long. Darave's run was just under 2 minutes shy of breaking the 2 hour mark, and Aang's had a lot to improve on from his PB, which he'd do the next day. After gathering items on the high wall of Lothric, runners head to the second boss of the early game, Vort. Vort is basically a dog in armor. He runs around on all fours swinging a giant mace at you, and once he's at half HP, he starts charging randomly. For this fight, you'll want to resin up your sword and then stay as close to him as you can. With expert movement, you can avoid his attacks and get in lots of damage. After Vort, you'll grab the Sharp Gem then head to the Curse Rotted Greatwood. Greatwood has a ton of smaller enemies around him, and to make sure none of them interfere, 
Runners throw an alluring skull as a fight starts to draw their aggro away. For the first phase, you'll put charcoal pine resin on your weapon, then attack three sacks on the Great Wood's body and arms before he slams the ground and enters phase two. The floor will collapse and you'll fall down below, but the strat is the same. Attack more sacks and get the kill. Once the boss is dead, there's one thing left to do, the Great Wood skip. The explanation is technical, but all it does is spawn you back at the top of the pit, saving about 8 seconds. He opts not to go for the FKS, as it's not the easiest trick to pull off, which loses him some time. And heading to his first mid-game boss after Firelink, he takes an unfortunate death before continuing. Eventually, players will arrive at Sir Wilhelm, a non-boss enemy located in DLC 1, required for progression purposes. Getting to Wilhelm involves some tight navigating, but it's made a bit easier with Scream Skip, a jump into a cliffside that pushes you to the top, skipping a long looping path and saving about 40 seconds. Wilhelm himself isn't fought, rather he's baited outside of his house and pushed off a cliff with a series of shield attacks, followed by a twin blade combo. Moving deeper into the mid game, he upgrades at Firelink before fighting Sullivan, and starts a very tough fight after a few more bosses, Osiris. The consumed King Osiris is hard for a few reasons. He can offer patterns where you're forced to take slower strats, and his second phase has him charged sporadically, with a single charge dropping your HP to just above zero. In the first phase of the fight, he gets an AoE ice spell that forces him to disengage. In his phase 2 starts, the boss charges away, losing him more time as he's forced to play catch up. He doesn't get hit, but the fight goes slow overall, saving 3 seconds but leaving a ton of time on the table. The rest of his run, he cleans up a lot of the mistakes and deaths he made from his PB, saving 40 seconds in the Nameless King fight and an entire 7 minutes on Demon Prince since he doesn't die a single time. Half Light and Gale both die on his first attempt, instead of taking 4 attempts on each. With his fantastic late game, the 2 hour barrier was smashed. When all was said and done, he clocked in at 1.44.55, a 30 minute PB and a huge world record. Angsmaster's run was good. With the route still getting figured out, it was the first that really showed how far the time could go with current strats. But a day after his 144, someone else would get a run. This is Nems, a Dark Souls 3 legend. He's held the record in every main category, and has been active in other Souls games as well, and it wouldn't take him long to get a run in after the launch of the second DLC. There are two bosses in the early game we haven't seen yet, so let's have a look at one of them. This is Wolnir. Wolnir may look intimidating, but the fight itself is very straightforward. It's optimized enough that if you look at the split timer, you see the strat displayed in just three numbers, 3, 8, and 5. After popping a charcoal pine resin, you just need to get three hits on Wolnir's first left hand bracelet, eight on the second, and then five on the right hand bracelet. Aside from RNG that determines where he puts his arms down, this fight is low variance, as the kill comes before he has a chance to summon any skeletons or use any of his larger attacks. Nems is about 2 minutes ahead of the record since he hit the fair and keep skip earlier, where Angs opted not to go for it. He does encounter some difficulty as he fails the scream skip going into Wilhelm, falling off the cliff to his death and losing 1 minute and 20 seconds, but he hits it without trouble on his second attempt. I'm gonna pick up my soul and do the jump at the same time. Is that god gamerish for you? Is that good? Is that good enough for you, chat? Following Wilhelm, the descent into Irithyll Valley starts, and since he misses the full combo on Sullivan's Beast, he ends up taking a death here on his way to Yorm before the Irithyll skip. The run back goes well, and after Yorm, he cuts through the other bosses in Anor Londo, arriving at Aldrich. Aldrich is not an easy fight, 
and with a tough run up to the castle to open the way, it's a split with the potential for some big time loss. The fight has two phases. In the first, Aldrich has an array of spells he can cast against the player, with your goal being to get him into phase two as fast as possible. You'll know he's there when he dives into the ground and teleports away, popping up in one of the corners. If you're lucky, you'll get a pattern where he stays in the corner and plays nice. Otherwise, you're in for some time loss. After a good fight, the next boss is waiting for him just outside, Dancer of the Boreal Valley. If you've played casually, you know this is one of the hardest fights in the game, but the speedrun is a different story. By staying to the rear of Dancer, you can lay down some big shots while being relatively safe, and once phase 2 starts, she'll spin away before coming to a stop, where you're just a few hits away from a kill. It's a fairly safe fight in the speedrun, as it's optimized to near perfection. With a low range of attacks to use, she doesn't pose much of a threat at stealing a run. With Dancer dead, he kills two more dragons, Osiris and Ancient Wyvern, then grabs some items for upgrades before leaving Wyvern's area, since his twin blade route is a bit different. He upgrades them to plus 3 with the sharp gem in the early game, then to plus 5 after killing Yorm. Now that he's killed Wyvern, they get upgraded to plus 9, which is where they'll stay for the rest of the run. With a fully upgraded loadout, he goes about killing the rest of the bosses, having fair fights on all of them and taking no deaths. But it's time we looked at another run killer, Nameless King. Nameless King is a wyvern riding boss with a mounted phase and an unmounted phase. The first phase has a few different attacks, with the lunge forward being the best players can get, as a well-timed combo into a ripost can end the phase quickly. Nems gets the fly around opener, which loses a few seconds, but it doesn't affect the combo and we're on to phase 2. Phase 2 is a lot more high variance, as NK can do long attacks with follow up counters and lightning spells. The general strategy is to keep to the back of him and try to bait out his swing attacks in wide sweeping arcs so you can roll over and get some damage in. Nem's fight goes quite well, and it sets the tone for the rest of the run as he gets deeper into the late game. After beating the Demon Prince, he makes his way to mid -ear, which has a long running section that's worth looking at. Having to descend deep into the ring city of DLC 2 and navigate through long dangerous sections where quitouts are necessary, just getting to mid -ear is a challenge. The long stairway into the swamp is particularly dangerous, with pairs of enemies and ranged attackers everywhere. One wrong move and it's game over. Nems gets caught once, but after his respawn, he makes it back and gets through the rest of the split no problem, arriving at the long mid -ear fight. Phase 1 goes well, getting only one flying attack, but early in Phase 2, he gets picked up and fire blasted, only surviving due to the 20 points he put into Vigor on his final firelink visit. With a few more dicey moments, he finishes the fight and sets to clear out the rest of the endgame bosses, and it's time we looked at Gale. The most cinematic and difficult boss of the run, Gale comes in at the end, with 3 full phases and a large HP bar. He's no pushover. The first phase has Gale jump around wildly, making use of devastating lunging attacks and wide arcing swings that can lead into multi-hit combos. Once he's down to two-thirds of his HP bar, he'll enter phase two, where he gains access to a crossbow and some spells, in addition to different combos. His third phase is the hardest of all, starting when he uses a large AoE spell. Gale is even more wild with his attacks in this final phase, using devastating combos and spells, An error here can spell death. Nem's fight goes well through phase 1 and 2. When he enters phase 3, he gets some disorienting combos with the camera following Gale as he jumps around, but he keeps his cool and gets the kill shortly after the second AoE. With Cinder left, and only two deaths in the entire run that both occurred outside of boss fights, Nems had a good chunk of time saved over the record, and he locked in a 1.36.51, 8 minutes and 4 seconds ahead of Aang's Master. The trend so far has been a record a day since DLC 2 released, but the next wouldn't arrive for 2 days, with Aang's Master striking back for a huge PB. You may have noticed the runners buffing their weapons before each boss fight. 
but for the early game bosses, they aren't simply applying a resin to their weapon. They're using a glitch called Tumble Buff. Tumble Buff is a glitch that allows you to apply resin to a non-buffable weapon. By trying to put resin on a weapon that doesn't allow it, the game stores that animation in memory. And if you then use a spell with a consumable, the resin gets applied anyway. This is especially useful in the early game, before you get the twin blades, as the weapon being used isn't compatible with resins being applied. But this glitch has another use, duping. Duping uses the same mechanics as tumble buff, except it dupes the item you're using, be it resin or souls. This is especially useful for the item and upgrade route, as you can increase your soul count without having to kill additional enemies, giving you access to upgrades earlier. Moving into the run, Aang's opts to use the FKS this time, and hits it first try. Then he carries this momentum through the early game, getting a gold split on Wolnir, and stopping at Firelink to upgrade his Twin Blades to plus 4. Through the mid game, he saves 20 seconds at the Dancer fight, as his PB had some bad RNG that broke away from the scripted fight, but his Osiris fight is much more interesting. He enters Osiris with a huge amount of time to save, and starts the fight off great, but disaster strikes as he goes for the kill. With his run on the line, he opts for a high risk kill after getting charged instead of healing, and clutches out the fight for a minute and 20 seconds of time save. They, I, this thing could have not, just not hit and I would have been dead, really. He upgrades his Twin Blades to plus 10 before heading back into DLC 1 and confronting the boss that Wilhelm opens up, Freyda. Another three phase fight, Freyda comes out of the gate with a giant scythe and long flourishing attacks. One of the worst things that she can do is turn invisible as this wastes several seconds, which she does to Aang's right away. He follows up after her attack and ends the phase quickly for round 2. This phase is incredibly difficult, as Father Ariandel joins the fight with Freyda. Armed with a giant cauldron and a fierce AoE attack, he's tricky to get damage in on as it is, and with Freyda attacking and using frost spells, it's even worse. Once you kill Ariandel, Freyda comes back for one more round. Now armed with a second scythe and whirling combos, she's capable of dealing massive damage, which forced the player to disengage and heal if hit. Aang's encounters a lot of problems in phase 2. When it's all said and done, he loses 17 seconds, but with a 2 minute lead, he's still very much ahead of his PB, and within striking distance of the record. Moving into the late game, he saves 3 entire minutes on Midir, cleaning up a lot of his mistakes, and then at half light, he has a fantastic fight against the notorious Time Thief, grabbing a gold split and extending his lead to 6.5 minutes. The route he is using swaps the boss order around a bit. Some bosses from the mid game were moved near the end, particularly the Lothric Princes. Located at the top of Lothric Castle, you have a bit of a run to get to this fight, sprinting through a wyvern, the Grand Archives, and another long section before finally arriving at the Fog Gate for the boss. A two phase fight, you start off against Lorien wielding a one-handed greatsword and the ability to teleport around the arena as the fight plays out. Like most bosses, your goal here is to roll around to the back of him and hope he doesn't teleport away, as phase 1 is mostly RNG. For phase 2, his brother Lothric joins him, adding some spells and the ability to resurrect into the fight. Circling around the boss in this phase is especially important as you want to damage both bosses with your hits. Killing Lorien first will have Lothric attempt to cast the Resurrect spell, which is where you want to end the fight, as its success prolongs the fight greatly. He loses a bit of time on this split, mostly from the teleports in phase 1, but he's so far ahead, a couple of seconds don't make much difference, and he goes to Old Demon King before heading to Cinder. There isn't much to say about ODK, he's a bit of a meme in the run. The most dangerous part of the split is the worm in the smoldering lake as you make your way to ODK, but even that isn't too deadly. With a quick kill on ODK and a huge amount of time saved on Grave Tender, he's seven and a half minutes ahead. As Cinder falls, he hits a huge PB and a new world record of 133.05. With the record approaching the sub 130 mark, 
Engs and Nems would battle it out for who could lower it first. And just two days later, Engs Master would use an improved route to try and be the first to do it. Instead of taking the Black Firebomb at the start of the game, players now took the Fire Gem, as they could infuse it into the Short Sword to make the Fire Short Sword, which increases the damage you do on early game bosses. You take a small time loss on Ayudix Gunder for this choice, but the other bosses go fast enough that it's more than worth picking up. Despite this, his early game isn't fantastic, as he doesn't hit the FKS until his third try, and by the end of the Wolnir split, he's 40 seconds behind his PB. He upgrades the Twin Blades to plus 5 after finishing the early game, and heads to the first boss of the mid game, the Deacons of the Deep. The route to Deacons is quite interesting, as you need to run through two giants on the way there, and if you couldn't tell, these guys hit hard. The Deacon fight itself is essentially a slot machine, as you need to kill specific enemies possessed by a red star that falls down in the fight. Once you kill five of them, the final Deacon spawns, but a quick combo will end the fight before he can do any harm. The biggest time loss here are special Deacon spawns that require you to navigate around or through the crowd. It's not a hard fight, but does have some variance beyond the player's control. He continues through the mid game, and we still have a few bosses left to cover, so let's talk about Champion Gundyr. Essentially a rematch of the Ayudix Gundyr fight, Champ comes equipped with a few more moves, but by applying a Human Pine Resin and parrying two of his attacks like in the Sullivan fight, you can take him down in about 25 seconds, if he gives you a good pattern. After Champ, he heads to Ancient Wyvern, and while the fight goes well, something bizarre happens as he picks up the items before Firelink. The camera bugged out, causing him to fall off the cliff. With the time loss accepted, he moves on, getting a decent Nameless King fight to make up for the unintended death. He struggles with Freyda, as she repeatedly disengages before he can end Phase 1 and he gets frostbitten early in phase 2, which leads to a near death as he tries to survive. Phase 3 goes much better, and he's off to some more difficult fights. He rounds up 4 bosses from here, with Midir giving him the most trouble, as he decides to charge around and chain combos into AoE breath attacks. He finishes the fight without taking a hit however, and makes it through half and Gale without much trouble, which brings him to Dragon Slayer armor. Equipped with a giant shield, huge axe, and thick armor, Slayer can plague runners by shielding from their attacks, leaving them in a hard position to deal damage. He has some difficult combos to dodge as well, and the sweeping attacks he uses have a huge range, meaning you're not safe even behind him. He doesn't shield too much during the fight, and Engs gets a good kill. After the fight, he doesn't think the run can record, as the early game in Demon Prince went about as bad as it can go, with some difficult fights still remaining. Continuing the run, he saves huge on Grave Tender. With only ODK and Cinder left in the run, he pushes forward. Making a meme out of ODK, he sets up the animation cancels for Cinder, and misses them all. But it's not enough to stop the world record, which he hits by 4.5 minutes, for a 132-14. Aang's Master didn't get the sub-130, but Nems was still grinding runs, looking to complete a sweep of the main categories on the leaderboard and get the first sub-130. He'd set a record on the 5th of April of 131.23, but the video has since been lost to time, so instead, let's look at the Half-Light fight. One of the hardest in the run, it's a long drawn out fight with three stages. To initiate the fight, you have to kill Adjudicator Argo at which point Guardian 1 will spawn into the room. You'll want to make quick work of the Guardian as Half-Light isn't far behind, and once he spawns, you're in for one heck of a fight. With quick combos, devastating spells, and the ability to roll out of your combos, Half-Light is one of the hardest fights in the entire game, if you couldn't already tell by the names players give his splits. During the fight, a second Guardian will spawn, and this can be catastrophic, as Guardians have the ability to cast Healing Miracle, restoring a large amount of the boss's HP. The strategy here is to keep them both in your sight while you try and take out the Guardian first, unless Half-Light has enough lost HP to be killed quickly. That's really all there is to it, 
With a large toolkit to attack you with and the ability to escape damage, Half-Light is just an all-around tough encounter that inspires nothing but dread into runners. Nem's next run would take place on the 6th, and it didn't have the best of starts. He almost died grabbing items before Vord, and then again before Volnir, picking up the Grave Warden's ashes. There's one boss in the early game we haven't talked about yet, the Gatekeeper before entering the mid-game, Crystal Sage. Sage is an interesting boss, as the longer the fight goes, the higher chance he has of entering patterns and attacks that cost large amounts of time. After taking a certain amount of damage, he'll teleport away, splitting into clones, so it's optimal to kill him before this happens. If he gives you a certain pattern, the early kill is possible, as you can hit a big ripost off of a parry, if he attacks with his rapier. But Nems ends up getting two teleports, and loses 24 seconds on this fight. He stops by Firelink, then heads to Deacon's, where he encounters some trouble navigating with giants. The fight goes fine, but the time loss has him 8 seconds behind his previous run. Things get worse as he moves into Irithyll, as he fails the Irithyll skip 3 times and is forced to try another controller, finally hitting it on his 5th try and losing 40 seconds. He makes up a lot of this time loss on the next fight, as Aldrich goes spectacular, saving 28 seconds for a great gold split. Moving through the mid game, he fights to get back closer to the green, with the run taking a big upturn after Wyvern, as he hits a large string of gold splits. After a 10 second time save in Dragon Slayer, he's plus 25 on his PB, with a little over 30 minutes left to go with some of the hardest bosses in the run. He announces to chat that he's going to try a different strat on Princes, because when you're on world record pace, why not? He drags the boss to a corner in both phases, and it doesn't go the best, but he still saves 8 seconds here. There's one boss we haven't covered in depth yet. He's been teased, and he's one hell of a fight. It's of course the Demon Prince. Involving a very dangerous run around the angel enemy that requires multiple save and quits, Demon Prince really brings meaning to the phrase out of the frying pan and into the fire. You have two bosses to fight at the same time, Demon in pain and Demon from below, and you'll want to focus on below first. Each of these bosses have a YOLO charge they can do, making it hard to damage them, and Pain has a long range spell he will shoot off periodically. Once you've taken care of both of them, Demon Prince will spawn, and he has some nasty patterns to attack with using jumping fireballs and heavy physical combos, but the worst is his charged AoE, where he takes to the air and rains multiple projectiles at you. Nems has a decent fight with DP, but the worst thing happens as he exits the fight. That was good too. No! No! This crash means he may have to fight the boss again, but luckily he was given credit losing some time, but more importantly, keeping the run alive. His endgame isn't the best after this, with Midir and Half-Light each stealing time. He saves 17 seconds on Gale, but misses two animation skips in Firelink, meaning he needs Cinder to give him 14 seconds of time save, or the run is dead. As he hits the final shots, his time comes in. 1, 31, 17. Small PB, but still world record. With the pieces of the route falling into place and the run getting more optimized, we wouldn't see records come in every day. But the next run Nems got on wouldn't just be with an optimized route. He started off great, making use of a new strat on Greatwood where you don't throw the alluring skull and instead pull off some specific movements to avoid the enemies. He steamrolls his way into a gold split on the FKS, but runs into big problems as he goes into Watchers as an enemy lances him for a costly death, stealing 30 seconds. Going from minus 21 to plus 8 on one split in the early game hurts a lot, and Sage offers no parry during the fight, meaning he's in a 38 second deficit coming out of the early game. The very next split, he hits Scream Skip, then absolutely destroys Wilhelm for a gold, saving 40 seconds and being back in the green. His Osiris split is a great example of why you need to upgrade your Vigor to 12 early, as he eats the charge in phase 2, which would have killed him without the extra stat increase. Osiris puts him back in the red from the rough phase 2, and it only gets worse from here, 
He fails the grave pender skip on his first try and loses 35 seconds. But that's just the tip of the iceberg, because then this happens on Freda. Winning the rematch, he's 2 minutes behind PB, and with 20 minutes of gameplay left, you're probably wondering how he pulls off a record, as even hitting a gold split on DP has him still plus 146, the best possible time of 132-34. All hope would have been lost if it weren't for the lower partake skip. Recall that the run up to Midir is incredibly long, with a preliminary fight happening on the bridge. The lower partake skip cuts out half of this run and the fight on the bridge, as it allows you to drop down into the real Midir fight. The how of the glitch is complicated, but at its essence, the Locust Preacher has an attack animation that captures the player, and if the conditions are right when he sets you down, you'll fall through the floor out of bounds. You just save and quit at the right time, then run to the pit with Midir, and then you're in the fight. Nems gets an unbelievable pattern, getting Midir low enough that he's able to stagger and kill him after just one attack from the boss in phase 2. Thanks to the lower partake skip, he saves just about 4 minutes and is ahead by 154. He gets a little nervous in the half light split as he loses over a minute, but with 2 gold splits on Gale and Cinder, he finishes strong for a world record of 129.55 and the first sub 130. With a death before Abyss Watchers and another in the Freyta fight, there was a ton of time on the table to take back, which is what he set to reclaim on his next run. He started off great, being even with the first few bosses before he nails the FKS and hits a clean run through to Watchers, claiming the 33 seconds from a death in his last run. Moving into the Boreal Valley, he finally hits the Irithyll skip on his first try, but has some trouble with a pack of dogs just a bit later and is forced to save and quit. When he makes it to Sullivan, the fight goes off without a hitch and he's en route to Yorm, where he assures chat that he will achieve the world record today. I should be streaming all day today, so I should be able to get I'll, I will, I will get a record today at least. After destroying Yorm, he's about 50 seconds ahead of his previous run, and with some skillful shots, he almost kills Dancer before starting Phase 2. Continuing on into the mid-game, he gets as far as one minute ahead after hitting the CSS on his first try, before stopping to Firelink for upgrades. He golds Nameless King with a great fight, then adds more buffer at Gravetender before arriving at Freyda. Phase 1 goes well enough, but Phase 2 has some really bad things happen, with Nems needing to make some tough decisions on how to react. He gets out alive, and with a touch and go fight on Phase 3, he claims back his lost time to be over 3 minutes ahead. With the run going so well, he's got the potential to have a lot of bad fights and still grab a comfortable record. Demon Prince would try his best, giving multiple jump attacks in Phase 3. Then he finishes the fight when the unthinkable happens, which he sort of predicts. The crash had the chance of making him do the fight over, but since he paused after the fight, he got credit for it and was able to continue without a huge time loss. Now he's on to Midir, where the lower partake skip was waiting, and you might be wondering, if there's a lower, does that mean there's an upper? The answer is yes, and it was discovered a few days after the LPS. There's a section in the first of the split where you need to save and quit 5 times to bypass the Judicator enemy safely before continuing on, but with the upper partake skip, you're able to bypass the rest of this section after killing the Judicator and head straight to the LPS. The upper partake skip saves an additional minute in combination with the LPS, so you can get to the Meteor fight very quickly now, and with a decent fight, he's just a few splits away from the world record. Half Light causes trouble as usual, having Nems use all of his flash to complete the fight, and he doesn't waste the opportunity to mock the boss opting to kill him with a throwing knife. From here, he golds the Gale split to coast to a world record by 332, thanks to the new skip and zero deaths throughout the run. With the introduction of the partake skips, Nems had pushed the record down by 5 minutes in just 2 runs, and with more time to save, things were looking good. There was a new skip that Nems had tried and failed in his last few runs, and he'd set to work on doing attempts, but someone else had started the category as well. This is Distortion 2. Distortion 
Distortion is a god when it comes to Dark Souls games, having held records in every game in the series, and the final DLC for Dark Souls 3 wasn't going to be an exception. His level of familiarity with the series is uncanny, with many of the glitches used by runners being found by him. If there's a way to break it, Distortion will find it. His first record came on April 16th, 2017, just three days after Nem's run incorporating both partake skips. So let's have a look. His early game starts off fantastic, getting as far ahead as 16 seconds after he kills the Greatwood. Across the next few splits, he'd lose a lot of his time save, falling back to 3 seconds in the green after Sage. His mid-game threads the needle between the green and red, with each split gaining or losing a little until he arrives at Ancient Wyvern. He opts to go for the fast setup CSS and misses his first attempt. The second attempt from the stairs misses too, and he doesn't kill the boss until his third try at the glitch. Things only get worse, with Champion Gundyr giving him a bad pattern and stealing 8 more seconds to put him almost 50 behind his PB. He heads into the final bosses of the mid game, making it to the Lothric Princes without issue and starting Lorien, taking 2 hits in this phase, but fortunately only getting the one scripted teleport. Phase 2 has a teleport right after the intro spell barrage, but it goes great after that, stopping the resurrect and saving 15 seconds as he starts to cut the time deficit he'd built up. A bad opening on Nameless King ends up costing him big, but with the Grave Tender skip and fight going well, he more than makes it up, saving 20 seconds back before his final stat upgrades at Firelink. The skip that Nems attempted in his runs was up next. The Angel Skip, a jump that has you cut out the long walking section along the branches before the Demon Prince fight. It's not the easiest skip to pull off, but the 40 seconds it saves is well worth the risk, and after Distortion hits it, he has an okay DP fight, which ends on the same crash that Nems had, but you've probably guessed the run doesn't end here. With the massive time save, he finally has breathing room with the remaining 4 bosses but he's not out of danger yet, with both partake skips and three of the hardest fights in the run. Midir goes great, and he golds the split for 12 seconds of time save. He runs into trouble on half light, but still manages a gold split, carefully baiting and countering each attack during the fight. The run had picked up enough momentum that nothing was stopping it at this point, and with Gale stealing only 10 seconds, he finished the run at 125.36 beating Nems by 47 seconds and taking his first records in the All Bosses category for the new DLC. Dist would set another record later that day. His early game went up and down, eventually coming ahead after Sage and extending that lead to 20 seconds after finishing off Wilhelm and Deacons. He misses the opening parry on Sullivan and opts to reset the fight instead of continuing. This costs about 8 seconds he hits the pattern on the rematch, but things get interesting at Aldrich. Normally, you tumble buff your resins onto the weapon you have equipped, but Distortion applied it in the intended way, only having one left. If he died in the fight, he wouldn't have another for the rematch. He says a prayer and gets to work, taking a huge shot in the opening before starting phase 2, where it all comes down to the pattern Aldrich gives him. He dodges the attack from the first teleport then gets a second. With a well placed combo he ends the fight, saving 2 seconds in the process. Moving deeper into the mid game, he doesn't get the big time save he has on Ancient Wyvern, as he fails the first two attempts at the CSS, but he has flawless execution on the champ fight, and keeps up the momentum going into the Nameless King. Not everything would go fantastic, as he finishes the mid game, GT steals 8 seconds from him and Freyda is worth having a look at as he enters the endgame. For phase 2, runners try to focus on Ariandel, as he's easier to hit and dodge, which means you want Freyda to leave you alone for this part. By throwing a knife as the phase starts, you can draw her to the other side of the room and focus on Ariandel mostly uninterrupted. Distortion didn't have his knives equipped for this phase and had to adapt to a harder fight engaging Ariandel with Freyda in close proximity. With some difficulty, he gets through the phase and finishes the fight, losing only 5 seconds despite the grave error. He hits Angel Skip on his first try, 
and from there, the run finishes itself, golding the DP and Gale fight, giving him more than enough buffer to grab record, despite a bad cinder fight. It would be a few days before Dist had another run, with his last one being just a small improvement and still having 40 seconds left on the table in the Wyvern fight alone, the sub-125 was well within reach. Getting into the mid-game, things were going well enough. Not making the tumble buff mistake on Aldrich saw him 8 seconds ahead and he killed the Devourer of Gods. The interesting thing that happens in this run is the strat starting to develop on the Dancer of the Boreal Valley. Normally, runners get as much damage as they can on Dancer, then wait out the deadly phase 2 combo before finishing her off. But Dist had another plan. Instead of standing idly by out of harm's way, Dist found some narrow safe zones inside of the combo, which allowed him to get a hit in while she frenzied. He misses the follow-up shots and kills her after the combo finishes, but the concept was proven in a run. It would just come down to who could execute in the future. Moving through more bosses, he gets to Arch Dragon Peak, where there are 40 seconds to save over his last run. You might remember the CSS being tried off of the small altar at the back of the fight. While this method can work, the success rate is very low, as it requires the boss to enter a specific pattern. This doesn't deter distortion, however, and he moves to set up the fastest version of the trick. <clears throat> With that, he saved 43 seconds and added small time saves as he entered the late game, being 48 seconds ahead before he starts Freyda. The fight with her isn't the best, and the run takes a turn for the worst when he has three attempts on Angel Skip before being successful. The fight with DP went great, as a strat had been developed that prevented the boss from getting a single AoE off in Phase 2. The damage was done though, and he lost 11 seconds off of this fight from the Angel Skip attempts. But that would just foreshadow what was to come, as he made his way to mid-year. Dist gets the worst mid-year fight in history, as the boss decides to fly around the arena and shoot off his breath attack instead of engaging directly. At the end of the split, he's lost 40 seconds and is in the red by 26, and with two of the hardest bosses still on the table, he's not in good spirits. I'll continue the run just for the hell of it, but yeah, the run's over unfortunately guys. I, it's actually over, like I'm, I'm gonna be behind now. Half-Light starts off normally, with Dis managing to lay down heavy damage before the second Guardian spawns, cutting his time loss by 22 seconds, and leaving the run largely in the hands of Gale. If the sub-25 is happening, he needs him to cooperate. The first two phases go phenomenally, and it appears as though Gale is going to let the record happen. But deep in Phase 3, he gets a second AoE, and decides to hang back instead of going for the kill. Unsure if this was the right call, he finishes the fight, saving a few seconds to be just 0.3 behind his PB, leaving Cinder as the final hurdle for the record, and the sub-125. He has time to save here, as Cinder in his PB wasn't the greatest, and after hitting both animation cancels, he's looking good. In Phase 1, he gets a lot of follow-ups and struggles to get in any damage. It all comes down to his Phase 2 execution. Good RNG, heavy combos, and he's killed Cinder. Final time, 1.25.02. A new world record, but not the sub-125 he was hoping for. Nice. Hey, it's still PB! <laughs> Jesus Christ, dude. Can't believe we still PB'd off this fucking garbage. It was clear by now that the sub-125 was possible. But who was going to do it? Nems? Engsmaster? Darve? Distortion? The answer would come just six days later, and it had a big surprise in store for one of the hardest bosses. Despite a second try FKS and some trouble getting the Grave Warden's ashes, Distortion would come out of the early game 11 seconds ahead after killing a single Teleport Sage. He worked his way through the mid-game bosses until he made it back to the Wyvern fight, where things don't go as planned. He fails the quick kill that worked last run three times before going to the stairs and hitting the backup strat, which proves costly, putting him behind by about 37 seconds. 
The deficit wouldn't be easy to overcome, but with a great fight on champ, he'd pick up some time. And with Nameless King and the Grave Tender, he'd cut the deficit to just two seconds behind. The late game is where it gets interesting, as he starts making high risk decisions when fighting the bosses. Raid of Phase 3 is a great example of this, as he opts to stay close to lay damage down while taking a bunch of shots in the process. Now we get to Midir, just 13 seconds ahead of the previous run, and we know how it went last time. Would we see a repeat? Or would Distortion triumph over the Dark Eater? Not wanting to lose 40 seconds based on raw RNG, Distortion got to work over the last 6 days developing a scripted fight with Midir that eliminated the flying patterns. By following the script, you limit him to just 3 attacks in Phase 1 and a single attack in Phase 2 or you're able to pull off the execute, saving a ton of time, or in Distortion's case, a minute and 20 seconds. You would think world record would be locked up at this point, but there was still half light to fight. And it's a good thing he saved as much as he did on Midir, because Half Light stole 43 seconds, a sizable amount, but not enough to stop the record. And he closes it out for the first sub 125 in history, with a 124 19, on April 25th, 2017. Nice. It would be a few months before we'd see another record. And that's because new routes were being developed and tested to save more time over the ones players were currently using. Aang's Master would be the first to try a new route, but since this is a transitory record, I won't go into too much detail as the route would see large refinements over the next few runs. Aside from the boss order getting shuffled, the times at which the twin blades and stats get upgraded are changed around to make certain bosses easier. It can be said that the boss order changed to accommodate a better upgrade route. Now you'll see the Twin Blades upgraded to plus 3 before Sage, with the player detouring through the Smoldering Lake to pick up the Titanite Shards, and then again to plus 8 before fighting Freyda, who is fought after Dancer instead of Grave Tender. After two more bosses are defeated, the final stop to Firelink for Twin Blade upgrades takes place, bringing them all the way to plus 10. Once two more bosses are down, you make one more stop for the last stat increase of the game, then head off to finish the nine remaining bosses. It may seem like a lot of running around, but the Firelink visits are done in a way to facilitate encounters. The prime example being that after the final stats are added, you go to the hardest string of bosses. DP, Midir, Half-Light, Gale, then Grave Tender. The run ends on Cinder and Engs was 14 seconds ahead of Dis record going into the fight, and finished with a 124 flat. Over the next few months, more changes would be made, and Nems would make his return to the category in brilliant fashion, claiming the record, but also showing off a new route. As I mentioned previously, the routes rarely alter the early game, and it gets off to the same start, with Nems collecting Titanite shards in the Smoldering Lake upgrade his weapons before killing Sage, but then things get different. He rolls through Deacons, then heads to Unorlando to clear out the bosses there. After that, he goes right for Osiris and has two flasks for the fight. Make that one, which gives him a unique problem. He needs a flask to use tumble buff, which means he won't be able to heal if he takes damage. If he doesn't take the tumble buff, the fight will be longer, and he'll be down a resin. He opts to use the tumble buff, which means he needs a clean phase 1, or a charge will kill him in phase 2. He pulls it off, and then eats a charge, but it doesn't matter because he's Nems, avoiding damage in the rest of the fight. After this, it's Nameless King, ODK, Firelink for stats, Grave Tender, and then an actual fight with Wilhelm. Rather than shove him off a cliff, which takes time to set up, players now fight Wilhelm since they're fully statted up with very strong weapons. It's not without risk, and you can lose time, but overall it saves over the old strat. From here, you kill Freyda now that she's open, and then slot into the old late game boss order, EP, Midir, Half-Light, and finally end with Gale. Nems would grab a 123-22 with his first record on this route, September 12th, 2017 there were still lots of kinks and wrinkles to smooth out. 
A runner named Horst would set a record on October 25th of that year with a time of 123.18, but it's since been lost to time, and about a month after Horst's record, Nems would look to improve on his mistakes from the previous run. Using the same route, he has a decent early game aside from some small trouble on Greatwood, and as he moves into the mid game, he builds up a great lead, being 46 seconds ahead after killing Aldrich on the first teleport. He gets a rare problem in the dancer fight, taking a shot which almost kills him, losing just over 10 seconds. The Dragon Slayer armor takes another 10 seconds from him, with the middle section of the fight having some difficult combos and shield attacks to deal with. On the Prince's fight, he works to make up 5 seconds, not trying a new strat in the middle of the run, and using the semi-scripted fight instead. His next string of bosses go well enough that he's able to build up more time save by getting favorable patterns, but when he starts the DLC 1 bosses, things start going bad. With a second try scream skip into a horrific phase 1 grave tender, he ends up losing 26 seconds on the first boss he has to fight here, and Wilhelm doesn't offer him much in terms of time save, giving up just a second. Freyda isn't any better, with Nems begging for the boss to kill him and end the run as he gets trampled by Ariandel, coming out of the fight 11 seconds behind with Demon Prince up next. I just want to die. I want this run to die. He has a lot of time to save on this split. Missing the angel skip last run had him use the old route, meaning that a first try skip will give him about 50 seconds of time save for free. He sets up a mid laser fire from the angel and nails the skip. The fight doesn't go fantastic but the close to a minute of time he saves on the split is a testament to how important the angel skip is to the run. Being this far ahead isn't a guaranteed world record, as you should know by now, with the hardest bosses still waiting at the end of the run. But it wouldn't be a boss that threatened the run. It was this. No! Oh my f***ing god, what? The partake skip isn't a 100% success rate, you need to quit out at a certain time in your fall just after the character screams, or you risk dying or loading in at the wrong section of the ring city. Nems quit out early and thinks the run is dead, but as you hear on his gold split audio. Wait, what? And I guess I guess Nems what? Nems is just the god gamer, so he can just Wait, what I've never had that dude. What? With the scripted mid-ear fight, the rest of the run goes great and he finishes 54 seconds ahead for a 122.27 on November 14th, 2017. There would be one final record in 2017, the 19th since DLC 2 was released and it came from a runner named Synatic. Exclusively a Dark Souls 3 runner, Sin was very familiar with the game and it was just a matter of time before he put his mark on the category. His early game didn't have many issues. He made use of an alluring skull to clear the bridge on his way to the Abyss Watchers before arriving at Sage, where things take a turn for the worse. He struggled to bait out the attack in order to set up the parry and loses a bunch of time. It only gets worse when Sage hits a teleport. Overall, he's plus 22 coming out of this split, putting some pressure on for the mid game. He cuts through some of the red with good splits on Deacons and Sullivan. But Aldrich is another story, narrowly avoiding death on the run to the boss and then getting two teleports in the fight to come out plus 25 overall. His luck starts to turn around when Osiris charges a wall and gets stuck in phase 2, letting him make up some time before making his way to the Lothric Princes after Firelink. Despite getting two teleports on phase 2, he saves a lot of time here, and the run sees its first foray into the green since the early game. It's a battle to stay ahead over the next few bosses, with each fight seeing him gain and lose, tipping the scales of speed in either direction. He gets the Nameless King, and the run tips back into the red, and when he arrives at champ, things get worse, as he misses the combo and almost dies by getting trampled. Despite having to retry the scream skip, the DLC 1 bosses start off fantastic, with the GT skip and fight going great to be back in the green by about 7 seconds. Freyda in his PB was horrible, and he saves big here with good execution to put him 52 seconds ahead. With 3 skips and 4 bosses left, he 
He hits every skip first try. Angel skip first, then both partakes after a prolonged phase 1 DP. He saves another 40 seconds with the scripted meteor fight, and he's looking unstoppable. Half-Light and Gale both give up some more time, and he hits a huge PB for his first world record in the category, with a 1-21-41 to close out 2017. It wouldn't be long in the new year before Nems plowed through another run, and on January 9th, he'd do just that. There's not much to say about this run, other than he cleaned up his final two boss fights with Half-Light and Gale, saving huge amounts of time on each boss from execution alone. It wasn't without trouble, as he needed three tries to hit the Irithyll skip, getting a strange pattern from Phase 1 Dancer. But things were changing in the Dark Souls 3 scene, and we'd see those changes slowly come to fruition in the coming months. The next record wouldn't be until April, during which time the route had undergone some big changes. The first to try some of the new changes would be Abyss, an Australian runner with top times in lots of the Soul series games. The biggest change Abyss would use is the exclusion of the Titanite Shard pickup in the Smoldering Lake, before fighting the Crystal Sage. Instead, the route uses a more natural path for collecting the shards, combined with duping boss souls to buy them from Firelink, with the boss order and upgrade visits remaining unchanged. He'd come out of the early game not encountering many problems until the Sullivan split, where he hits the Irithyll skip second try, and uses an alluring skull for safety. He eats a ton of damage to finish the fight in an effort to save time, and he's in the green as he moves to the next boss. The run to Aldrich goes great, and the fight even better, with the boss only getting off a single attack for a huge 18 second time save. Yorm decides to give him perfect RNG, not getting a single stomp in the fight, and he builds up a huge buffer moving through the mid game, being 28 seconds ahead after Dancer. Dragon Slayer presents a good pattern, and Abyss executes perfectly, adding more time to the bank as he keeps collecting interest boss after boss. He starts off the DLC 1 roundup in fantastic fashion, hitting the GT skip and having a good phase 1, but his luck runs out on phase 2, losing 13 seconds to Wolf. Wilhelm adds to that time loss, with the knight getting a heal off during the fight not just once, but twice. Despite the trouble, he's still in the green, and as Freight starts, he makes a prediction. I mean, this should be guaranteed, like, world record. In speedrunning, there are a lot of famous last word moments, but with a perfectly scripted DP fight, he saves big, carrying the momentum into mid-year, with first try skips and a great fight. Half-Light doesn't go great, with lots of spear trolls and damage getting piled on through the fight. He loses a total of 26 seconds, but he's still 51 seconds ahead, and Gale isn't going to take that much, especially with a gold split. Abyss's prediction came true, and he'd enjoy his spot at the top of the leaderboard until Nems came back with the first run using one of the fully finished new routes. This route keeps the twin blade and stat upgrades in the same spots. The major changes are the order of bosses deep in the late game. After the final Firelink visit, you'd go to Nameless King and ODK, but they're now at the end of the run, with the DLC 1 bosses taking place next with Gravetender, then Wilhelm, then Freyda, before the DLC 2 roundup. Using this route, Nems would get off to a great start, slowly gaining time as he went into the mid game, coming out of Ancient Wyvern 24 seconds ahead. It's worth mentioning that on his first visit to Firelink, he leveled his decks to 40 instead of the 38 or 39 you saw in the previous routes, and the reason for this is that it saves a small amount of time menuing overdoing it during a second upgrade. Slayer takes some of his time away, as Nems misses the killing blow and has to re-engage to end the fight, but he more than makes up for it in the DLC 1 bosses, leaving that area with a total of 56 seconds in the bank. It would be a slow bleed on his accumulated time save as he moved deeper into the late game, with things coming to a head at Nameless King, entering the fight with 34 seconds of buffer he was confident in world record happening, as his PB was just one second behind Abyss's world record. Nerves were starting to get to him though, and despite getting the best phase 1 opener, he fails the follow up 
and get some really bad patterns. This mistake wouldn't cost him the run, but it did cost him a sub 120, locking in a 120-21 after the ODK victory lap. Alright, GG, you got the world record. Who gives a f A month later, Nems would come back to the category to correct some of his mistakes, and it started off great, being 5 seconds ahead after the Vort fight, a lead which he would keep until Sage, where a spell would cost him 3 seconds. A lead wouldn't start to develop until he was about halfway through the mid game when he was gearing up for the Dragon Slayer fight. With his miss killing blow from last run, he has some time to save in this fight, but it doesn't get the start he was hoping for, with an early disengage happening. Getting desperate for a good Slayer fight, Nems goes for the high risk kill and almost dies, and moving in front of the boss has him queue up for an attack instead of a backslash had he moved behind him. Overall, he lost 8 seconds in this fight to be just 2 ahead, with 4 bosses left before he even enters the endgame. He cuts through some of the deficit from the Slayer fight, making a running save on the Lothric Prince's fight to stop the revive in phase 2 to keep the run alive. The run was looking really dark at this point, and Freyda starts off with a troublesome phase 1, but Ariandel goes flawless and she keeps close to Nems in phase 3 which limits the combo she'll go for to smaller ones. Losing 6 seconds in this fight, he's off to mid-ear and half-light. Despite getting hit by a nasty combo in the half-light fight, he does manage to save time, entering Gale just 14 seconds behind, and managing to save 3 more seconds over the course of that fight, leaving Nameless King and ODK as the world record hurdles. Last run, NK went about as bad as it can go, but Nems wasn't going to let that happen this time. As good execution alone meant he'd have a small world record. He gets the fast pattern in phase 1, then hits the execution strat flawlessly, but phase 2 is another story. It's like the game can sense when Nems is on a world record pace run, as it sent every lengthy combo that NK has at him. Eventually, he gets hit by an AoE strike, then opts to go for the execute into the kill, which is slower, but does stop the boss from throwing out any more combos. He saved an amazing amount of time on this fight to be 26 seconds into green, which is more of a testament to how bad the fight went last run. He does the victory lap and locks in a 1-19-51 on June 10th, 2018. He hit a 1-19-28 just 8 days later, but this was purged in the Twitch DMCA sweep. It was largely just an improvement over his fight with Wilhelm, but something was changing in the route, and one of the splits was about to be overhauled in a huge way. 16 days later, there was a big discovery in the route that cut out one of the worst sections of the game. If you recall back to one of the first routes we went over, there was one optional boss fight that was required in the run. Here's a hint. He rolled out of four combos in a previous run. That's right. Wilhelm. Required to access Freyda, Wilhelm was a terrible encounter since he could cast spells, roll out of attacks, and heal himself. But no more. Found by PG Mike and expanded upon by Distortion, the Wilhelm skip does exactly what it sounds like. It skips Wilhelm. Operating much like the Farron Keep skip, it uses a death cam abuse combined with a few other mechanics to allow the player to run up these branches and enter the Freyda fight without having to kill Wilhelm, as the door to the church doesn't load when using this glitch. It's not the easiest skip to execute, as you have giant crabs at the bottom that can block your way and enemies on the branches armed with arrows, but the risk is worth the reward, as a successful Wilhelm skip saves over a minute. The first run with the skip has been lost at time, with Nems hitting a 1-18-47, but his next run would come just 3 days later, so let's have a look. The Wilhelm skip also coincided with another route change. Instead of doing the DLC 1 bosses all in one go, Grave Tender was moved to just before Nameless King at the end of the game, since it didn't make sense to detour for him before the Wilhelm skip into Freyda. This became known as the plus 4 route, as you upgrade your twin blades to plus 4 at the first Firelink visit along with only increasing your deck score here. At the next stop after Wyvern, you put them to plus 9 and grab 29 Endurance before hitting them a final time after the champ split, plus 10, with Viger going to 20. This means you're fighting Osiris without a Viger upgrade, 
So to deal with the chance of getting a one hit kill, runners equip the assassin's armor, which leaves you with a small amount of HP if you get caught in a charge. Nem's run on July 7th was incredible to watch. Coming out of the early game, he was on a mission to push the new skip as far as it could go. He gets perfect Yorm RNG and saves a huge 20 seconds, as his previous fight had a stomp that resulted in a cycle loss. Moving deeper into the run, he finally gets a decent Dragon Slayer fight that saves him 2 seconds, which sets the tone for his fight against the Lothic Princes, where he nails a huge gold split. At this point, he's built up a huge time save, and as he arrived at the Wilhelm skip, he said it himself. Okay, time for the easiest skip in the game. He ended up losing 40 seconds here, dragging him back to being just 16 seconds ahead. The end game is a roller coaster, with Freyda being a huge gold split. But the victory is short lived, with Demon Prince taking 17 seconds back in the worst fight anyone has seen in several runs. The run isn't looking good after Half Light takes 12 more seconds to put him at just minus 5 and he's running against a very good Gale fight, as a gold split only saves him 0.2 seconds. Cinder, Gravetender, and NK are the serious fights left in the run, and he saves some time back on Cinder, but not enough that a bad GT can't steal it. He enters phase one, and GT blocks two shots, but before disaster can happen, Nems finishes the fight and makes quick work of the wolf to gold yet another split, before dropping this line. Imagine I didn't f*** up Partake and uh, Wilhelm skip. <sighs> this would have actually killed the category, I don't give a shit. It would have killed it. He saves one more second on NK before the victory lap, and locks in a 1-18-17. But his run wouldn't stand for long. Someone else started doing attempts. The completed plus 4 route brought a lot of competition to the category, and 15 days later, we see the first of two runners to lay claim to the record. David Tancre, the first claimant to the record, would use the plus 4 route to great effect, but it didn't start off the best. Finishing up the bosses before Sage, he would be 9 seconds behind in the early game, which isn't the best with that part of the run being highly optimized. He'd save big on Deacons, getting a good run and favorable RNG, until Yorm got mad and literally stomped away his time save. It would take some hard fought bosses before he was back in the green after the Dragon Slayer fight, with the run taking some ups and downs through the mid game until he arrived at the Wilhelm skip. He wasn't taking any chances with the enemies and opted to throw an alluring skull to draw their attention, which pays off big, as he has no trouble getting up the branches or moving around the crabs. Raina goes fantastic, especially phase 2. Instead of drawing Ariano to the corner, he runs up and destroys him, getting a great pattern in lieu of using the regular strat, and finishes the fight minus 12 with gold split. DP is another story, where he loses time to a second try angel skip followed by a bad phase 1 with the two demons bleeding a bit more time. After all is said and done, he's half a second in the red. At this point in the history, Medir had achieved meme status, with runners getting so good at the scripted fight that a normal split only saw them plus or minus a few seconds, assuming the partake skips went well. Half Light had not become a meme. Despite a scripted strat being possible, it was incredibly difficult to pull off, and runners hadn't mastered it yet. The second Guardian gets off a heel, and he loses enough time that record doesn't look possible. At this point, he has Gale, Cinder, GT, and NK left for bosses. With 11 seconds separating him from record pace, it's not an impossible task, but not a position you want to be in, as each boss has the power to take more time than he's already behind. He has a blistering fast Gale, with each phase going as well as they can, putting him barely in the green. But we're not done yet. Cinder starts phase 1 by running to engage, then throwing out some follow ups. Phase 2 starts with a Barry Bonds combo, but David goes full aggro in an attempt to save time. He saved 20 seconds on Cinder, then went on to gold the GT split, putting him to minus 35 and about even with Nems. Once again, a world record was in the hands of Nameless King. He narrowly hits the stagger in phase 1, 
getting the attack in the last second. After a shaky start in Phase 2, he hits some well-timed rolls and avoids all damage to finish the fight just a second ahead of Nems. He runs the victory lap to ODK and locks in a 7 second world record with a 1-18-10 on July 22, 2018. A week later, and 23 days after the Wilhelm skip was discovered, Nems would get a run that improved on his previous mistakes. If you look back, he lost 40 seconds on the Wilhelm skip, had a second try upper partake, and the early game had some spots for refinement. He'd hit a PB where he picked up some time save in the early game, but had a few disasters in the mid game, having a bad fight with the Lothric Princes and almost dying to Dragon Slayer. Slayer was one fight he just couldn't catch a break on. He cleans up his Wilhelm skip and gets 30 seconds back, and hits both Partake skips first try before nailing a gold on Half Light to be a minute and 40 ahead. And despite a bad Gale fight, he says, yeah, it's not even finished yet. I can lose like another 30 seconds for free. He almost did lose his free 30 seconds and ended up with a world record 49 seconds ahead of his PB with a time of 1.17.28 on July 30th, 2018. It would take a few months before the next runner took the record with the plus four route. And in November of 2018, we'd see the last record on the route as it was. This is Coltrane 25. Coltrane was another Dark Souls 3 exclusive runner. Having times in all categories, he'd get on a run that was one of the best in his career in the category. So let's have a look at the Midas run. We haven't looked at the early game in depth for a while, and it's because the bosses are low volatility. Runners generally don't lose or gain much time here, except on the occasional Sage fight. Coltrane would break the rule, saving 20 seconds up to the fair and keep skip and then another 6 seconds coming out of Sage. Compared to the world record, he's already 25 seconds ahead. Eakins would put a big damper on his pace when he missed killing the third spawn and had to heal twice during the fight. He had 16 seconds to save over his PB here, so there was still a lot of time left on the table. The Irithal bosses start off at a blistering pace, with a gold Sully split into a good Aldrich fight where he saved 12 seconds. And when Yorm offers up perfect RNG, he saves 30 more seconds to be over a minute ahead before he's even halfway through the run. At this point, he's ahead of world record by about 30 seconds, and the time save keeps piling up, hitting a great Wilhelm skip and staying even after Freyda. You'd think that the run would have to take a bad split eventually, but not only does he hit a first try angel skip, he saves 27 seconds on the DP fight and push his pace to 146 in the green. The brakes do get put on as he approaches Medir. With a second try UPS, the tome was set, as he dropped the scripted fight, which had Medir fly around before landing to shoot off a laser breath. He picks up the fight in phase two, but the damage had been done, costing him 38 seconds in total. Luckily, this was the only major issue with the run since he golded the Half-Light fight and carried the momentum through to another gold split in Grave Tender. Nameless King would try to steal the run, but 23 seconds of time loss isn't remotely close to derailing this run, and he hits the ODK victory lap for another gold split, to PB by a minute, and takes the record by 34 seconds. Coltrane had the Midas touch, achieving 6 gold splits in his record run, and breaking the 117 barrier. The next record would be the last of 2018, and it would get closer to the 115 mark, as Nems once again picked up the mantle. But he had a new trick in his bag this run. He'd be 10 seconds ahead coming out of the early game, with the mid game going well, despite some rare trouble from Dancer before he found himself in a familiar situation at Osiris. He has one flask going in and ends up using it before the second phase, which proves to be nearly fatal as he takes a shot, leaving him with 1 HP. He finishes the fight, but now has a decision to make. Use a bonfire to restore his flask while only being able to take one hit, or continue in a one hit death state until it's convenient to bonfire. He grabs the bonfire at the untended graves, deciding that the risk wasn't worth it, and continues on, eventually arriving at Slayer 
Does anyone want to wager a guess as to what kind of RNG he gets given his history with this fight? If you guess bad, you're actually wrong, as Nems finally gets a Slayer fight he's content with, being 24 seconds ahead at this point. After hitting a good Wilhelm skip, he says, 34 seconds ahead without elevator clip, and I have a minute to save later on. Woo! What's elevator clip? Let's have a look. Normally in the Meteor split, you do two partake skips, upper than lower, but there was a faster method of getting out of bounds waiting for players in the elevator on the way to the lower partake skip. By setting up your position carefully and executing some movements at precise angles, you can buffer your position as the elevator rises so that you can clip outside, which then allows you to access Meteor even earlier than the LPS does. Nem sets up the elevator clip, then this happens. Dude! No! I found it! Oh my god! Oh my god! How many times got fucking slid? He fails the jump after the clip three times on the quit out, and then gets a crash on the fourth successful attempt. It was as if the game knew he was on pace once again. With the 37 seconds of time save this provided, despite the three failed attempts, plus some more gained in the last few bosses, he locked in a world record of 1.16.19 on December 15th, 2018. The last of the year, and the first using the elevator clip. He wouldn't get to improve upon his mistakes in the last record for several months, but he wanted the sub 116 and returned to the category with a vengeance. Things in the early game wouldn't go his way, however, running into problems on two of the running sections before stabilizing on the Sage fight. But the damage was done, and he was plus 18 coming out of the early game. The Aldrich fight went fantastic, hitting a very quick kill after the first teleport, going into the green for the first time in the run. From here, he accumulates time save on just about every split, and when he comes to the elevator clip, he misses it once, twice, and finally hits it on the third try, losing 20 seconds on attempts. He was far enough ahead that he could still grab world record even after half light took 18 more seconds, especially since he had a near perfect gale fight, with the run finishing at 1.15.59, just one second below the 116, but not the record he was looking for if you listen to his post run commentary. That run was so shit. <laughs> okay, I lost a lot of time on half light, a lot of time on Madeir. So 40 seconds alone on Madeir. And then I lost, I was 20 seconds behind in the early game. Them splits going to be so nice to run against. I lost a minute. I can get a 114. A month later, he'd get the chance to correct his mistakes. And he was right about two things. His early game was great to run against, and he had 40 seconds to save at mid year. Instead of being 18 seconds behind after Sage, he cleaned up the Vort and Volnir splits to be minus 15. But a few bosses into Irithyll, he encounters disaster against Aldrich, eating a huge shot in phase 1, which leads to a second teleport, losing 12 seconds in the process. He receives another time loss from a small error, teleporting to the wrong location, which cost about 10 seconds. But his prince's fight had something happen that no world record had seen in history. Normally for phase 2 of the prince's fight, you want to circle behind them to try and limit the number of teleports they do, but there was a faster strat. If you can get the bosses to spawn while you're in a certain position, they will never turn around as long as you only damage Lothric. The fight ends when you kill Lothric, so fortunately you don't need to kill Lorien in phase 2. It's hard to pull off in the regular fight, and this strat is rare to see in a run, hence why this is the only record in history where it happens. From here, he golds the Wilhelm skip and keeps the momentum into a gold Freyda fight, with great first and third phases. Demon Prince has him save 2 seconds despite a second try angel skip, and there were definitely time saves to be made in the fight, as both phase 1 bosses had a YOLO charge. Now we're finally back to mid -year, and only 2 skips separate us from the fight. UPS is hit flawlessly, and as Nems approaches the elevator, he performs a setup and clips through first try, then makes the jump down into mid -ear, all in one shot for a huge 35 second time save. At long last, 
Nems had a run where he hit all the major skips first try, with the exception of Angel Skip. The remaining bosses in the late game were tough, but not tough enough to steal the run, as he finished with a time of 1.15.23 on October 2nd, 2019. Over the course of two years, Nems would hold 17 records and set numerous milestones in the category, but there's one person that could compete with him when it came to Dark Souls 3L bosses. This is L.R. Fool. Fool is a well-known Soul series runner, with top times on Bloodborne and Dark Souls, in addition to multiple records in Dark Souls 3. In November of 2019, he'd set his sights on the All Bosses category, and he'd come with one of the other routes being worked on, the Plus 6 route. It shares a lot of similarities with the Plus 4 route, except for two key differences that both occur in the mid-game. The second Firelink visit occurs much earlier, taking place after Aldrich, where you put the Twin Blades to plus 6 and increase the Vigor stat. The significance of the plus 6 may not seem readily apparent, but in the Dancer fight it shows its strength, as you're now able to kill Dancer in the Phase 2 opener instead of waiting for the combo to finish. The other change it has is on the boss order after Osiris. Instead of fighting Wyvern, Firelink number 2, then doing Slayer, Lothar Princes, and Champ, it has you fight Champ, Slayer, Princes, then Wyvern, after which the routes sync up, where you hit the final Firelink visit before the endgame. Since your Twin Blades aren't plus 9 after Wyvern for Slayer, Princes, and Champ, the plus 6 route makes a few adjustments, having you apply Pale Pine Resin for Slayer and Princes. And since you're lacking considerable firepower for Champ, he requires an extra ripost. With his first record using the plus 6 route, Fool would demolish every boss and hit every skip first try, saving a whopping 22 seconds on Nameless King alone, and grabbing the first sub 115 in the process, with a 1.14.57 on November 16th, 2019. A month later, he'd come out of the gate with a huge early game, being 21 seconds ahead after Sage, and extending that lead to minus 30 going into Osiris, where some unfortunate positioning on the boss's part saw him lose 11.3 seconds to missing damage cycles. The run would hover around the minus 20 mark until it was slowly cut down to just 10 seconds, eventually arriving at Nameless King, who we all know has the power to take a run with this small of a lead. It starts bad enough, and only gets worse as the fight progresses ending the split just one second in the green. If he gets wormed, or has ODK do anything but lay down, the run dies. He gets by the worm in the lake easily enough, and with a quick fight, he saves a small amount to set a new record of 1.14.54 on December 13th, 2019. Fool is a type of runner to only route something in when it's absolutely necessary to bring more time save into the route, and his next record six days later does just that. Normally when heading to Yorm, you need to climb down the rubble pile, then up a ladder to make it to the capital tower. A skip aptly named the ladder skip was found that bypassed having to go down the rubble pile to climb the ladder by making a precise jump between two destroyed walls on the platform, saving about seven seconds. Ool didn't hit it perfectly his first time, falling off the edge and having to save quit it out but the game loaded him on the other side, giving half of the time save. From here, the run went up and down, losing 20 seconds on mid -ear after he dropped the scripted fight, but Gravetender and Nameless King offer up enough time to bring him back for a 23 second PB with a final time of 1.14.31 on December 19th, 2019. Fool would set one more record in December to close out the year on the 29th, hitting the ladder skip without the save and quit to narrowly PB by 4 seconds. He wouldn't wait long, blitzing 2020 with runs to push the category lower and more optimized, setting record after record after record.
From January to June, Wool would set seven records, edging out PBs and breaking two more minute barriers along the way, until he arrived at his final time, set on June 24th, 2020, with some familiar situations. Coming out of the early game, he was ahead by point one, which speaks to how much he had optimized the run, as virtually nothing went wrong. He would lose small increments of time as he moved into the mid game, being just five and a half seconds behind going into the Lothric Princes. With a great fight, he'd be the furthest into the green he'd seen all run, just 0.3 seconds. But things started looking up from here, and moving to the Freyda fight, he'd save 8 seconds despite not using the throwing knife strat on phase 2. After the angel skip, he has a decent fight with below, but Payne starts with a YOLO charge before jumping around. Phase 2 goes great, and he only loses half a second here. He makes a meme out of the mid-ear fight, hitting all of the skips and the scripted fight, only gaining 0.7 seconds on the split, but a flawless half-light had him see 6 seconds of time save. A bad phase 1 on Cinder saw him lose some time on the fight to be back in the green by only 8 seconds, and with the wolf almost killing him on phase 2 of the Grave Tender fight, things were starting to look grim. He has 5 seconds to spare going into Nameless King, where he gets the best pattern on the opener. But phase 2 isn't great, losing 2 seconds on a split that demands perfection due to the optimization Fool put the route through. With just 3 seconds of green, 2 things need to happen. He can't get wormed while running through the lake, and ODK can't troll him with his club. With the lake clear, it's all on this, and with no unwanted surprises, Wool locks in his final time, 1-12-45, on June 24th, 2020. Despite only being released 3 years ago, Dark Souls 3 has 44 records in the DLC 2 era alone with the vanilla game and DLC 1 adding another 79 combined records to the history. But those are stories for another time. With many glitches and optimizations found along the way, it has one of the richest histories of a game with such a short time on the market, and it's all possible thanks to the dedicated community running and routing the game. The story surely isn't over for Dark Souls 3 or the series, but for now, we'll just have to wait and see what's next to come. Thanks for watching. Hey guys, I'd like to thank Nems and Matt Apocalypse for consulting on this video. It was a lot of work and you should go check them out as Matt is actively running the game and Nems is about to return from a hiatus and it wouldn't have been possible without either of them. Be sure to follow on Twitter for the latest updates or subscribe on Patreon for sneak peeks at what's next in the pipeline. Until next time.